Your book does an excellent job of explaining the three major theories, functional theory, conflict theory, and symbolic interactionism. Um, but one thing that you also need to do is be able to apply them. And so I'd like you guys to get a closer look at, at how that will go. So first off, if you're asked to apply functional theory to a situation, you want to approach um, any sort of, of issue or question from that approach, here is what you would do. Here are some questions you could ask. So first off, you would ask, how is this issue or structure helping society to work? How is it helping it to be more stable? These are called functions. You would also look, though, at any ways where that issue is making society less stable. Those are called dysfunctions. You'd look at the ways this issue or structure is intended to work. Those are your manifest functions. And then you'd maybe look at some things that it's still doing, but they're not the stated reason, and they're maybe not immediately obvious. And those are latent functions. So let's go ahead and apply that to serving a mission. So first up, you're going to look for the functions. You're going to say, how does this help society to be more stable? So first off, it spreads the gospel. It helps us find new members. It's a big strengthening to the people's lives who hear the gospel, um, but also to the members in the area, to the communities, if the missionaries are, are helping. I know my sister-in-law is in the Philippines right now. They've had some, some really rough time with natural disasters, and she's spent a lot of time on her mission helping um, helping to recover from those. And it's also a big strengthener, or at least it can be for the missionary, to strengthen their testimony of the gospel and, and their comfort in sharing that. It can also teach the missionary skills that are helpful for later service in the church in any sort of corner auxiliary. You would also then look at how this could make society less stable. So this is one I actually talked to one of my professors at BYU about. And she had worked for the church formerly, and she had been interviewing some returned missionaries who um, were mostly in poorer countries that um, were leaving the church after their missions, and they wanted to find out why. And one of them was that they were noticing that their companions from richer areas had all these opportunities with college and jobs in their future that they felt like they didn't have, and it was really disheartening for them. Um, those interviews are actually some of the things that encouraged the start of the Perpetual Education Fund to help members all over the world to gain that kind of education and training. Um, another one it, way it could make society less stable is if you have some sort of wayward or just troubled missionary. That's a lot of, of responsibility to put on someone between the ages of 18 and 21, and they could do a lot of harm in an area. So that could be a possible dysfunction. You then also are going to look for the stated functions, those manifest ones. And that would be things like sharing the gospel and strengthening the church. But you'd also look for latent functions. Maybe it's that it gives people language skills for a future job. Um, I know my brother's gotten a lot of jobs because he speaks Spanish. And then I've had a lot of friends who have either met their spouse of someone who lived in that mission area or that someone that was also a missionary at the same time as them. So that would also be a latent function. It's Your mission isn't intended for you to meet your future spouse, but it could work that way. Okay, let's go to our next major theory. That's conflict theory. And if you want to take a conflict theory approach to a situation, here are some questions that you might ask. So first up, what are the scarce resources in this situation? What is there not enough of to go around? Um, you're going to look for often that's money, but not always. It could also be power. It could be physical space. Um, it could be a lot of different things depending on the situation. You'd look for the types of inequality in this situation. Some common sociological ones are that you'd look for any sort of inequalities between genders, between age groups, between racial or ethnic groups, between people of different income and class levels, different religions. Things like that are, are common. You look for how people in power or people with the money, with the space, with the prestige, whichever it is, how are they trying to protect that? What are they doing to hold on to that? And then conflict theorists are really interested in change. Where a functional theorist is really interested in stability, conflict theorists are really interested in change, so they look for that too. So let's apply that to another topic. Here is conflict theory and college sports. So here are some things that you might look at. So some scarce resources, a huge one of course is funding.
All college sports are looking for funding. It could also be scholarships if you are the athlete trying to um, be able to play sports in college. Time could be a scarce resource, whether that's um, sharing practice time um, at the school or if you're an athlete that your time becomes the scarce resource. Prestige among, you know, different programs, different teams, that could be a scarce resource as well. You could look for all kinds of different types of inequality. In this one, you might see it between different sports. So, you know, maybe the swim team at a college is not getting as much funding or interest as the football team. You look at gender inequalities, and there's many different ones. I mean, a lot of people immediately go to, oh, well, women's sports don't get as much, um, you know, funding or interest or media. That is definitely true, but you can also look at something like Title IX, which where it was intended to give women a more equal footing in college sports, um, a, well, I mean, looking at it from a functional thing, a latent thing of that is that because you had to have equal numbers of sports, a lot of colleges had to cut men's teams, particularly in smaller things like, um, I know at BYU that's soccer, that's lacrosse, that's wrestling. Um, so that could be an inequality if you were an athlete in those sports and you can't get a scholarship anymore. Maybe you're going to look at racial inequality. Um, if people of a certain race are being favored in a sport or not, and if that's different for coaches compared to athletes. Um, maybe there is an inequality between departments, like maybe a college is funneling a lot of its money into sports instead of into a science department or something. Um, maybe there's inequalities between conferences in like an NCAA kind of setting, lots of things you can look at. The people in power, maybe they're going to make it harder for new sports at a university because um, if they add maybe a women's sport, maybe your team's the first one that's going to get cut. Um, maybe you would try to seek extra fundraising to make sure your team can keep getting the perks. And then ways you look for change, some issues that have come up recently. There's been a lot of talk of reforming the BCS, which is the football bowl system. That there are, There's been a lot of talk that that's not fair. Um, there's also been talk recently that college athletes should maybe be able to make money on their sport, particularly because a lot of their careers end after college. That's been in the news a lot recently. All right, now let's move on to our third major theory, and that's symbolic interactionism. So say you wanted to apply that to an issue, here is what you might ask. So who are the people interacting in this situation? Do they interact differently with each other, like all the different people in the situation? Um, how do your interactions change in different settings and with different people? How do our beliefs and attitudes influence our behaviors? And then what are the symbols people attach to this issue? Now you'll notice these questions are, are really different fundamentally from the functional and conflict theory ones. And it's because they're different kinds of theories. Functional theory and conflict theory are considered macro theories because they look at the behavior of large groups and structures in society. Symbolic interactionism is much more concerned with individuals and small groups. Both types are good, it just depends on the question you want to ask. So since we're looking at a small group, small thing, let's go ahead and look at dating. So, you know, who are the people and do they interact differently with each other? Just things to think about, you know, do you act differently on a blind date than on a date with an old friend? Do you act differently on a first date than with someone you've been dating for a while? You'd also look at how your dating interactions change in different settings and with different people. So, you know, there's really different expected behavior on a bowling date. You know, you can be loud, you can be kind of, of crazy, and that might not go over so well if you took your date to a devotional. Maybe not suggested. And then your behaviors at a devotional date, that it would not carry over really well to bowling. And... Um, with different people, maybe you're more comfortable on a group date or you're more comfortable on a single date. Beliefs and attitudes can really influence your dating behaviors. For us, that would be religious beliefs. You know, maybe that it kept you from going on dates before 16, even though all your friends did. Maybe it means that chastity is really important to you in a dating relationship. And then yeah, symbols people attach to dating, that's a bit of a minefield because there's so many. Um, a problem can arise when you have different meanings. So, you know, maybe for one person on a date, it's not a big deal to flirt a lot or to hold hands. But to the other person, that means, oh, you really like me and you're going to call me soon. So a lot of problems in dating can be with those different symbols. All right. For the last bit of this, what I'd really like to do is show what happens when you put all the 
these three theories to the same topic. And I picked war. If you're going to do all three, it helps to have a pretty broad topic um, because you're going to look at such different types of questions for each theory. So first off, if you want to take war from a functional theory point of view, you'd look for those functions. You know, you're solving a national or international conflict. You're rallying people to a cause. Maybe it's good for your manufacturing. You'd also look at dysfunctions like loss of life. Maybe it doesn't help. You keep being um, not stable. And then maybe there's a lot of political turmoil in your country over the war. You'd compare manifest and latent functions that manifest, it solves a conflict, it responds to the attack, but then latent could be, you know, with World War II, that was a lot of women's first time in the workforce. Um, a war can increase patriotism or decrease it, depending on how popular the war is, or it could launch someone's political career like it did with Eisenhower. Now, let's say you're a conflict theorist. Now, war and conflict theory, because of the word conflict, can can get a little hazy. So I just want to clarify we're not only looking at the two sides of the conflict. You would consider them, but you're looking at a lot more than just that. You're going to look at things like inequalities of money. Again, where does the funding go and who wants it? Maybe the war itself is over an inequality of land or resources. Maybe there's different levels of prestige and respect attached to different people within the war. And then you look at inequality with things like income level, gender, and age. Those are all particularly with the draft, since poor young men are more likely to be drafted because they're less likely to get exceptions. It is just men women aren't drafted, and then it's younger men, so there's some inequalities. And then you look at all kinds of conflicts. You look at um, generals and their troops, you know, they don't always have the same motivations, maybe between the home front and the soldiers, between industry and military. You look for conflicts and inequalities anywhere. And then in terms of change, maybe over time it changes who gets drafted, or over time it changes who works and who does what. That's a possibility. And then last but not least, we have symbolic interactionism. You look at all kinds of different interactions in a war between soldiers, um, diff individual soldiers, between soldiers and their officers, between soldiers and civilians, civilians and civilians, lots of options. Maybe interactions change during war. For example, um, the Germans and Japanese all of a sudden had a lot of prejudicial treatment against them in World War II, much more severe against the Japanese. And recently there was a high increase on ra racially motivated incidents or just sort of prejudice against Arabs after 9-11. Your belief about war um, existing is definitely going to influence your own participation or support. And again, there are tons of different symbols. Maybe to someone, war represents just loss of life. Maybe to someone else, it, it's, you know, we beat them, hooray. Maybe to someone else, that's a constant nightmare, and they're really struggling with, like, post-traumatic stress disorder. So it could be many things to many people. So I hope this helps you see how you would apply. You'll do something like this in your group project. Um, and feel free, of course, to refer to this as a reference if it helps.